Are we on? Are we good to start? Yep, we are good to start. Okay. Aloha, thanks to all who joined us. Hey, everybody. Senator Lee, did you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. First of all, uh, <clears throat> thanks everyone for joining. Um, you know, we've been doing these town halls for uh, a number of years now, and it's always a great time this time of year because the city council's got a lot going on. The legislature is in the midst of our legislative session. And obviously we're hearing from folks on a whole range of issues. So we wanted to take an opportunity to basically give an update, answer questions, and uh, really have a discussion to talk about the things that you guys want to talk about. So um, why don't we go ahead and introduce ourselves. Um, uh, Lisa, why don't you kick it off and, and Esther? Okay, um, aloha. I think, you know, possibly you folks know me, but um, my name is Representative Lisa Martin, and I represent District 51, which thanks to community efforts is still uh, defined by the Makapu Point, um, Women Alone part of Kailua. And um, this is my first term, right? So as a freshman, it's my second session. And um, we're actually more than halfway through. So bills have crossed over and the ones that are still alive have gone through their first hearing in the other chamber and are now waiting, if they have a second hearing, waiting for a second hearing. And I would really um, like the opportunity to talk to people about the bills that they're interested in, the topics they're interested in. Um, but, um, you know, I do have a number that were inspired by the district, one of them being the one looking at um, foster care issues. And the Waimanalo Neighborhood Board had created three very in-depth resolutions, basically asking for more resources for CWS and other organizations that take care of these kids. And I'm happy to say that regardless of what doesn't or doesn't happen with bills, there has been a significant um, new, new um, influx of staff and funds for training, for um, updating the computer system and for vehicles for child welfare service. In addition to a bill I have going that is trying to have mo more oversight for kids once they get out of foster care and are receiving adoption or guardianship assistance, we, I also have a resolution, which I believe, um, I believe Senator Lee introduced it in the Senate side, and um, that one is to audit child welfare service. So they're getting a lot more resources, and hopefully um, they can also have that influx of um, review and expertise to help them use it well. Um, Another thing that's kind of exciting in the district is we kicked off our um, study, a flood flood control study. That's the US Army Corps of Engineers. It's completely federally funded. I was told it couldn't be done, but um, there you have it, it happened. And we do have all the relevant state agencies involved, um, the city agencies, and also um, we're roping in now the um, the military organizations that also share that watershed. And so it's it's going to be a fairly comprehensive study that will not actually do any action to prevent flooding, but will have the engineering information that they need to then address hotspots with, with actual projects. And um, I will leave it at that. I, I just look forward to hearing from you folks about your area of interest. Aloha. And, and so sorry, I I, um, I forgot to go over a couple of the, the housekeeping measures at the beginning, of course. Um, so the, obviously the idea is to have a discussion here. So if you have questions that you want to ask about really anything, um, throw them into the chat and that way we'll be able to get to them uh, in uh, one at a time and make sure that everyone's questions, uh, if we can't answer them right away because they're complex or there's multiple uh, parts to it, uh, we at least have a record of it so we can follow up um, either uh, you know, Esther, Lisa, or myself with you after the fact and send out whatever information there is um, to everybody. So throw those in the chat. Um, and just for time's sake, you know, it's, it's just past 6.30. Uh, we're hoping to um, make this a good conversation but not keep everybody up too late. So we'll try and make sure we get to everyone. Uh, so if we dwell too long on one topic, what we'll do is we'll shift it 
and we'll try and uh, return to it later if there's time or just follow up after the fact. Um, so all of that being said, um, Lisa has uh, done a great job of, I think, highlighting some of the things going on at the legislature. Esther, did you want to give us an a update on what's happening over at the council? Thank you, Senator Lee, and aloha and good evening, everyone. As many of you know, the city council, um, they like to work all the time, so, so they don't provide us any relief, And but we're starting a new year, and uh, last year was very, very busy uh, for us. Uh, it was my first year, of course, it's my first term, and uh, during this time of the year, uh, what makes things a little more crazy than normal is in addition to our monthly um, committee week meetings or full council meetings, we also start the budgetary process, which was just kickstarted and I anticipate that we'll be going through um, through the ending of May with consideration of the budget. Uh, many of you who have participated in the uh, neighborhood board are, are well aware of some of the uh, bills that I have been working on that um, impact Waimanalo and of interest, of course, is Bill 38, uh, with which has uh, commercial activities at the uh, beach parks and right of ways. As many of you know, uh, it was passed by the full council on March 16th. So it is a, awaiting the mayor's uh, signature. Uh, he has until uh, April 5th to sign the bill into law. Uh, for any of you uh, who have been seeing um, uh, the concerns raised by opponents of this bill on the television, I highly recommend that you contact the mayor's office. Um, his number is 768-4141. Again, 768-4141. And uh, let him know of, uh, of your support for this measure. Uh, I am working with the administration to make sure that he doesn't veto it. And I would like to thank all of the community members who followed this bill throughout the process. Unlike most measures, uh, which uh, only require two, two hearings, uh, this bill actually had uh, three hearings. And the reason for that is I felt that uh, we needed, I needed more input and I actually deferred it for one hearing, if you guys all remember. So I felt that it was properly vetted, been around for six months. And so for opponents who believe that they didn't have ample uh, opportunity to comment, um, I don't believe that that is true. With regard to uh, the regulation of short-term rentals, Bill 41, many of you, you know, it uh, passed out of the Zoning and Planning Committee uh, yesterday. And I was able to add uh, some amendments that I felt would strengthen some of the concerns raised by the community. And that has to do with uh, requiring uh, most of uh, short-term rentals to have um, off-street parking and the banning of any uh, one who is using short-term rentals to public parking. Uh, so uh, the uh, full council is going to be hearing it on April 13th for all of you. And I, I see Barb um, there uh, on. Barb, thank you so much uh, for continuing to participate in, in this because the community really showed up yesterday. April 13th is the full council hearing and we need the community to show up. It's critically important. Uh, another bill that people are interested in has to do with the land use ordinance, Bill 10. The Department of Permitting and Planning is in phase two of uh, five phases that it is undertaking with regard to the ordinance. This phase, uh, what it does is it improves readability of the land use ordinance and it aligns uh, the approved general plan, the development plans and sustainability community plan. So that's what it does. And it, it, it has not had a hearing uh, when it has a hearing, I will uh, notify those who uh, are on some of my lists. I don't have a master list for everyone, so I send a list depending on those who are interested in certain issues. And lastly, I want to mahalo uh, the community for all your vigilance with regard to Olomana Agricultural Cluster. Uh, the application that was submitted to the Department of Permitting and Planning, as was mentioned by Director Thielen at our neighborhood board, it was denied on March 2nd, and the applicant has 30 days uh, to appeal it. I've uh, let DPP know that if they do appeal it, I'd like to know 
if they appeal it, and then I will uh, inform uh, the community of that. And I'm um, I'm willing to answer any questions after uh, Senator Lee provides his overview. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, I'll I'll just add a couple bills that uh, folks have been uh, writing us about that are moving along. Um, you know, we're, we're halfway, we're a little more than halfway through the legislative session. So there's definitely more opportunities to weigh in on some of these things. And they're only going to move if uh, folks weigh in. So I um, want to highlight, first of all, uh, an issue we've had on our side regarding illegal dumping. It's been a persistent problem on the sides of roads and in, in our um, forest areas and other places. And prosecutors have been having a hard time because the penalties just aren't sufficient in many cases to actually deter people. They keep doing it. Often it's repeat offenders. And so SB 2297, which is moving along, would add into the penalties the discretion to give a judge the ability to seize a vehicle that is being used in illegal dumping. So if someone continues to do it over and over and they're driving their truck to do it, then you potentially could lose your truck because some of these things are being dumped into our streams and causing like serious problems <clears throat> in many places. Um, Another one, uh, SB 3272, um, addresses an issue that we've been, we've talked about at a lot of community meetings, and that's regarding helicopters and safety over our communities. A lot of the um, uh, noise complaints and things we get. Right now, we have a great uh, federal delegation that's working on this, and the FAA controls all our, all our airspace. So um, we've got to really help our congressional delegation push the FAA to make whatever changes are necessary to make sure that things are done appropriately and we don't have them falling out of the sky. And just for reference, we've had you know, 20 some odd crashes in just the last handful of years and a whole bunch of deaths. So it, it is something that is not just trivial, but is, is real. And so um, 3272 will for the first time require basic reporting. Where are helicopter companies flying, um, especially if they're, they're tour operators? When are they flying? Are they deviating um, in their flight plans? Why? Just real basic stuff that right now isn't being collected by the DOT or by uh, really anybody. So it's hard to make a case and, and figure out what's going on without that information. So this bill would provide that. Um, another big one that we're seeing in our community, um, and I'll jump through a bunch of these, but basically uh, everyone's been watching, I'm sure I've seen, uh, unfortunately, like cases of bribery and um, just political corruption. And that's something that absolutely cannot be tolerated. And honestly, it, it, it really demeans the political process and makes, makes everybody involved look bad, including all of us just as citizens in this state. You know, if we don't have an effective democracy that is free from uh, that kind of influence, then, then nothing's working for anybody. So um, we do have a couple of bills moving forward. The first one is SB 166, and that's up for a hearing actually um, in a couple of days. And it prohibits uh, foreign co political contributions, which, which we until now have not barred. And especially when we're having influence from other countries and issues with Russia and other things, the last thing we need are um, outside folks coming in to influence our elections to try and get their particular development or land deal or whatever pushed through. So this would bar that for the first time. Uh, the second thing is SB 555, and this would prohibit fundraisers during the political fundraisers during the legislative session. The Senate moved it out um, a few weeks ago and it's moving along. Up until now, um, it's common practice to have fundraisers during the legislative session, which um, you know aren't necessarily, there's no indication that anybody's uh, doing anything illicit, but it, it definitely has the perception that there could be something there. So why even let that stand? You know, So this would prohibit that. And there's a bunch of other stuff, but I, I realize um, uh, I want to kind of make this more of a discussion and hear what you guys have to ask. So I'll stop there and uh, just thank everybody. And I just want to point out, you know, um, both uh, Council Member Kiel Aina and uh, Representative Martin and I were all out this morning um, in the community around the corner by Castle Hospital. Um, and Council Member Kiel Aina had arranged for the city to bring out a lot more support to work on homeless issues. So I just want to point out that the coordination I think we have between the city and the state has just been outstanding and really want to just, um, it's hard for the community sometimes, but I want to recognize that and thank thank everybody that we're working with for all their help because the only way we're successful is when we work together and we've got a great um, team for our community here. So with that, um, 
why don't we uh, hop into Q&A if everybody's open to it. And what we can do is start at the top of this list and maybe uh, if it's okay with you guys, we can uh, sort of take turns here. Uh, so the first question um, is how long does it take a, for a bill to become law? And uh, Esther, on the city side, do you wanna explain just a little bit about the process? Uh, sure. Well, uh, it takes uh, three readings for a uh, measure to pass. A resolution is uh, actually more expeditious, uh, as was evidenced uh, last December when we passed the Red Hill Bill in expeditious fashion. Uh, that normally doesn't take place, but basically uh, Chair Waters had the resolution agendized on the full council, so that didn't take very long at all. I forget the time frame, but it probably was within, within a week. Um, but that you really need the support from all of the members to move something like that. With regard to bills, uh, on Bill 38, for example, it would have probably passed faster if uh, we only had uh, two hearings, but we ended up having three hearings because uh, it was quite complicated in some of the aversions. And I felt that uh, after we uh, received a lot of uh, opposition that we needed to make sure that we properly weigh both sides of the issue. So I would say a couple of months um, because it takes, uh, you You have the first reading, right? And then you have a, a, a hearing. First reading is U Council. Then you have a hearing by the, uh, the committee, for example, um, Parks and Rec Recreation. Then it goes for the full council. So I would say you can get it done within six months. Six months for a bill. Oh. And 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 um, of course the chair has a lot of uh, power because he determines uh, whether or not um, something is calendar, as well as the chair of each of the respective committees. But thank you for the question. All right, and then Lisa on the state side, did you want to just sort of give an update of where we're at and and how much longer before these bills become law potentially? Okay, so on the state side, it's um, there's not as much variation. It's pretty consistent. Um, the answer is simple: it takes many years because it takes many tries. But within a given session, um, bills are introduced in January, late January, and they go through. They get referred to committees in the chamber, either the House or the Senate, in which they were introduced. So they go through first a first reading on the floor, and because of bill passes first reading, it doesn't mean anything. All bills pass first reading in a group vote unless there is a particularly contentious bill that somebody noticed and, and singled out. But generally they all pass first reading. And, um, and then they may or may not get heard in a committee. And at that point is when a lot of bills get weed, weeded out right at the beginning and they are never heard at all. If um, they can get referred to two different committees or they could get referred to three in the House. On the Senate side, they're likely to just get referred to two hearings, but those hearings can have multiple committees, sometimes three different committees in one hearing or two different committees. And so there's a bit of a logistical, you know, thing going on where they have to figure out how to schedule all of these and to get quorum for voting. But the idea is that the first committee is a subject matter committee. So if it's an environmental issue, it might come to my committee, energy and environmental protection, or it might go to water land. And then afterwards, if there's money in it, if it's asking for an appropriation of some sort, anything to do with funding, then it will go to finance. If it's just a legal change, then it would go to judiciary. And some of the um, ones go to consumer protection as their final committee. And they go through a similar process in the Senate, then everything mid session switches everything that's still alive. After going through three readings of everybody on the floor and either two or three hearings, then those that are still alive will switch over to the other chamber and um, you can have a companion bill, and I try to have companion bills for all of my bills, which means that a, an identical bill is introduced in both chambers. And so hopefully you would then have somebody in the other chamber who also um, believes in that bill and is trying to work on getting it through. Whichever one crosses first usually is the one that will stay alive. And then it goes through the process of hearings and readings all over again in that chamber. So there's really um, 
a lot of opportunities to kill a bill. <laughs> There's only one way to get it through, but there are so many ways to stop a bill. And, and then after it is passed, um, I'm not sure if I have the date right, but basically late April, beginning of May, then it goes to the governor. And that happens in the summer. He has a period of time over the summer in which he can, you know, um, in batches, go through the bills and sign them or veto them. Um, and so that happens in the summer. So you would get, basically, it takes about half a year once a bill is introduced to become law if it's, you know, if it works out. That was a long answer, but it's really a long process. Yeah, so um, thanks for that. Uh, there's a couple of questions um, to get us started here. What are the most important upcoming bills you need help from the community through testimony uh, in the Senate and the House? Um, I'll, I'll chime in uh, in particular. You know, I don't think there's like any one particular bill that stands out. I think it's what is important to you because we're going to be voting on hundreds of bills um uh in the next couple of weeks and there's almost um at most one or two hearings left for these bills before they're at their end so really if you can let us know what issues are important to you or of the bills that we're talking about which ones um you really want to track and follow we can connect you and it's really easy to follow along at the capitals website at capital.hawaii.gov um, and we'll throw that into the chat and you can just track bills right there, sign up, and they'll, they'll email you the updates. So if you want to testify, um, you have a one-click link to be able to uh, follow along and then sign up to do that. It's just real simple. Uh, but for me, I'd highlight um, one thing in particular, which actually isn't a bill. You know, for a long time, and this is uh, on the edge of Waimanalo, but back uh, behind the back roads um, in Olamana, uh, behind Olamana, you know, there's, there's Manawili next door. And it's been sort of a, a great partnership between the communities for, for generations. Um, and there's a lot of ag and other things that have gone on back there. Um, and in particular, right over the ridge, um, right past Bumpy's place in Manawili is one of the largest um, undisturbed heiau and um, uh, lo'i and terra systems that, uh, as far as we know, exist in the state. And it's just completely overgrown, but it's back there uh, waiting to be uh, cleaned up a little bit. Um, and then also uh, is the area where we have the Queen's Bath and where Queen Leo Kalani um, had uh, penned Aloha Oi and, and a bunch of other, there's like so much history in that area. That land is all private land right now. And it is, um, there were there were plans to tentatively have it sold and divided up into, um, I think, one acre gentleman farms and, and turn into uh, uh, that kind of thing. And so right now we're working to actually acquire that land with some of the residents in the area um, who've been working on this for a long time, uh, Uncle Oz Stender, who unfortunately just passed away, um, and working with the Trust for Public Land and the governor and our, our fellow colleagues to acquire what's about a thousand acres of, of this land with all this archeological history and, and um, everything and preserve that in perpetuity. And so that's something that uh, we're hoping money into the budget in just the next week here um, to do, which is going to be probably about $27 million or so, uh, give or take. And if we can do that and couple it with some federal funds that are available, we'll have that to preserve as a resource and not be just turned into uh, more of the Olawana Heights um, gentleman farms situation that everybody's been, um, I think, so, so up in arms about. So that's something that's not just a bill to watch, but it is it is funding that we can put in the budget to address a huge, huge um, part of our community, which is obviously right on the edge of Waimanalo. So I'll throw that out there and uh, turn it over, I guess, to uh, Lisa and Esther for uh, further things that you think should be highlighted. Uh, Lisa, did you want to go first? Uh, well. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, first, I'll talk about another bill that is uh, in the works, but I really need everyone's call on, on Bill uh, 38 to get it to the finish line uh, with the mayor. Um, I've been in this business for 30 years, and um, 
I don't um, rest on my laurels. I believe that nothing is secured until the, the ink is on the paper and signed into law. And again, the mayor has until April 5th. I highly recommend within the week, I, uh, I did call to find out um, who has been calling in. And right now it's mostly in opposition uh, to the bill. With regard to Bill 41, we need everyone's call on April 13th uh, for uh, if you want uh, improved uh, regulation of short-term rentals. And one bill that I'm working on, and I will make sure I get it out to the community, uh, has to do with um, modifying the ordinance that established the Oahu Historic Preservation Commission, uh, which was established over 20 years ago and has not been stood up by a, by a single mayor. And uh, one of my first hearings last year, I was at a zoning committee and the Department of Permitting and Planning, everyone looks at things that are not being acted on and they propose to repeal it. And there was an effort to repeal it. And of course, I, um, I stopped it and told uh, Chair Elefante uh, that, um, that I would have voted no if he, uh, if he called for a vote. And uh, I've been working with my staff uh, for the last year uh, to uh, look at how uh, we can address the criticism by DPP. And that is mainly that it doesn't want something duplicative of SHIP, the, the State Historic Preservation Division. So I've been working really hard. Uh, we should have a, a bill crafted within the month. And uh, the reason I'm optimistic, hopefully if we get everyone's mana on it, that it would be stood up is that uh, we, um, made it a hybrid with regard to the appointment process. So both city council members as well as the mayor would be able to appoint certain members. So I'm confident that if I succeed in these amendments that we might get it stood up. Against that backdrop, uh, I also am putting in the budget uh, process, a position for an archeologist at the Department of Permitting and Planning. And uh, during the uh, a recent resolution uh, where the ship the administrator was uh, testifying, I actually asked him if he supported us establishing the commission, and he said yes. And I asked him if he supported an archaeologist position, and he said yes. And I need to let you guys know that that is very helpful for the Department of Permanent Plan to be in the room and hear that. And so I'm going to make sure that Shipti is on uh, the, um, you know, testifying at the time I have the hearing and I'll let the community members know. So for me, that is something in the works and I'll notify everyone when, when, uh, when I have it introduced. Um, there's another question from, uh, this was a direct message to me, but I'll, I'll read it out. Why is the Senate, who has the authority, not conducting its own investigation into the um, death of uh, Ariel and the role of uh, child welfare services? And you know, I can say um, right now, most of the, well, for, the first thing is um, it's a little bit too early for the Senate to start or for any really entity to, to dive into it until that case is, I think, resolved. Um, and we know what's actually going on. But secondly, because we're in session, all the investigations for COVID stuff and other things are all sort of um, uh, backburnered until the legislative session is done because everything's about uh, trying to get all the bills through for the community and get the budget done and all of that. So there, there will be a return to that. But I know um, in particular, you know, Representative Martin had been working on a number of the bills to try and dive into that situation. So uh, Lisa, I don't know if you want to talk about some of that and where that's at um well basically in terms of the investigation you know there is um the the birth family um is you know basically is suing the state and so that is going on that court case is going on right now and um yeah so i think that that's you know we have to let the judiciary look at that and and resolve that um, and bring everything to light, what happened and why it happened and decisions were made and if they were made correctly. Um, I view, in addition, obviously there is a criminal prosecution with the city prosecutor for the um, adoptive parents 
So that's a separate case that will be going on or is going on right now. So that's kind of on the judicial side. What I viewed my role in the legislature is, is trying to prevent this from happening again by um, shoring up child welfare service so they have better resources to do a better job and also try to get more um, oversight by them. Um, it's been a little bit hard. It turns out, for example, Ariel's um, parents, adoptive parents were receiving money, the same money you get for a foster child after adoption. And this is very, very common. There's actually no income requirement. Anybody who adopts or becomes a permanent legal guardian for a foster child can get payments continued all the way until that child becomes independent. You know, either 18 or they leave home or whatever. And there's actually no oversight at all, I was surprised to learn, zero. Um, basically, twice a year, they just fill out a form that says, yes, I would like to continue to get payments. And yes, the child is still in my care. And so I wanted to extend oversight to those groups um, since the state and federal government are paying them, but it turns out there are legal problems with that. You can't make that um, assistance contingent on, for example, visits, super, you know, supervision type visits. And so I think the best uh, constitutionally, you just can't do that in the same way that we can't, you know, do midnight raids on welfare recipients to check them out or something like that. So um, it seems like the best we can do is try to have a um, program within Child Welfare Service that proactively tries to schedule visits. And in those visits, they can offer continuing services. As you know, these kids are by definition traumatized. Either they were traumatized by abuse with their birth parents, and that's why they were taken away, or the act of being taken away was traumatic. And so they um, are likely to need help over time, you know, mental health care and support over time. And sometimes um, the issues don't manifest themselves until the kids get older. And so an opportunity, you know, having that visit is not just a pair of eyes to check out the situation that the kid is living in and check out the kid themselves to see how they're doing. It's also an opportunity to connect families with state, city, nonprofit services, the whole range of services that are out there that maybe that family didn't need before, but now that the child is older, they do need, or maybe those services didn't exist before and they're new. So it's really an opportunity to do that. But what it can't be, unfortunately, from my perspective, is it can't be forced. It has to be a voluntary visit. But I'm hoping that if it's presented as a positive thing, as an opportunity to connect with resources and services, we will get a continued um, connection with those families and be able to support them. And also, of course, notice when things are not as they should be. And that can spur an investigation. Anybody, if there is an allegation of neglect or abuse by anybody, doesn't matter what their status is, if they have anything to do with foster care, public assistance or not, that will spur an investigation no matter what. Um, and that's, you know, that's the case now. So that's kind of a long winded answer, but it's been a very frustrating process for me. <laughs> and I'm not sure what bill will come out in the end. But, um, but I'm hoping that um, at very least, we will have um, more resources and hopefully an opportunity to audit and, and improve the processes at Child Welfare Service. And I'll note um, the resolution um, that Representative Martin wrote, um, which I also introduced in the Senate, is uh, at least on the Senate side up for a hearing, I think, uh, Monday, Monday or Tuesday. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm in the midst of looking it up right now so I can throw it into the chat. So it's another place to comment on. Actually, um, that is another, that was, um, me and Lisa had asked about what we need support for. To be honest, my bills that went over to the Senate are done with testimony. They don't need testimony anymore because they've passed their first committee. And in this last committee in the Senate, they don't take testimony, but that resolution will be heard in the House as well. And it hasn't been scheduled yet, 
but when it is scheduled, I could really use some support for that one. So I will blast that out. I don't know if anybody here follows me on social media, but if you don't, um, that is a good place to get news. I always um, basically beg people to testify for things through social media. So at Lisa Martin or no, Rep Martin or Lisa Martin Hawaii, either one. Um, and so for folks who are just joining us, I know a few had joined after uh, we opened up. If you have any questions, the intent is to make this just Q&A, open discussion, um, throw those questions into the chat so we can add them to the list and just knock them out as quickly as we can to make sure that we answer everything that we possibly can. Um, so with that, up next was, why isn't the helicopter data being collected? Um, I think this was off of the helicopter bill I'd mentioned earlier, um, which would, for the first time, collect data. So. To date, um, the federal government doesn't collect detailed uh, helicopter tour data, um, and the state doesn't collect it, and I don't believe the city does, um, and Esther, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, um, but right now, the bill that we have, which is SB um, 3272, would require as the condition for getting a tour helicopter permit, so for the business to operate and, and ferry people around in helicopters, they have to report just the basics. Where are they flying? When are they flying? Um, uh, are they deviating from where they're supposed to be? Uh, and how many people are with them? That sort of thing. So hopefully that is something that we can um, provide to our federal um, representatives and senators, and they can use take to the FAA and say, hey, we have you know some traffic air traffic problems over here with a lot of complaints or safety issues or what have you and actually have data to back up some of the complaints that we're hearing from the community. So keep an eye on that bill, um, but hopefully this will be the first time that we're able to collect that data and actually do something with it. Um, so other questions running down, um, what plans does the city and county have for the land Hawaii Kai of the Convenience Center? Uh, did you, and I don't, Whoever asked that, I'm actually not even familiar uh, with what they're talking about. If whoever is asked that question, could do you know who asked that question? Yeah, that it's was- uh, Kinani, I think I might be familiar with that lot. Um, and I think it's state land. Um, Kenani, are you still on? Um, I think that is the, it's, um, I think it's state, um, it's ag, it was an ag lease um, pasture land. And it um, is that the one you were you were referring to, Kenani? Do you, if you were able to chat and tell us if that's the right thing? Yes, the one next to the convenience center. Yeah, yeah. So the convenience center, um, it's city run, but it's actually state land, and on the Hawaii Kai side is also state land, and that's been a very contentious piece of land. I'm actually not completely up to date on what the status is right now. I've been a little busy with session, but that's one where the tenant, his lease was, um, he had eight years left and he wanted to transfer the lease and extend it at the same time for a million dollars of personal profit. <laughs> and, um, and the board of agriculture did not approve that. And he sued um, chair case of DLNR um, for interfering in, in his approval. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think maybe, I'm, so I'm not sure what the status is right now of that land, but, um, but it will, if he um, releases it back to the state, um, then, then it will be leased again. Sure. And, uh, uh, I, I know this was just asked in the chat. Um, since we have kind of a, a cozy little group here tonight, if folks want to raise their hand and ask a question live too, feel free to um, raise your hand and we'll know to call on you. Um, that said, um, Kapoor wanted to ask um, that we support all bills that support those that are going through re-entry from the prison system, like HB 2309, 2344, 2169 that are still waiting to be scheduled for hearings. That's fun people, not prisons. Um, I can briefly speak to that. So there's a number of bills that are moving along to try and reform our uh, criminal justice system, because obviously what we're doing right now um, hasn't been working. We take 
folks who have um, you know a really minor infraction and because of the way that our system set up often they can't afford bail because they just can't afford it so by virtue of being not wealthy um, they're forced to spend time at OCCC where they're put in with other people who do much more heinous things and all of a sudden you're um, basically creating hardened criminals by forcing them into these situations and then on the back end it, we're not providing the kinds of rehabilitation and reentry and job training and all the things that we need for someone coming out of prison to be successful and so the only option many have is to just reoffend. And that's why we have, in many cases, recidivism rates that are, um, you know, way, way higher than they should be. So what these bills, some of these bills try to do is provide that continuity of care. How do you um, ensure justice is served, but then provide people an avenue to be productive in society and not just be um, let out of prison with often no uh, IDs or documentation, nowhere to go, no job. And in many cases, uh, a record that says, even though you've served your time, um, you know, you are a convicted criminal and no one will hire you. So how do we fix all that? And that's really what this is all about. And um, uh, we can check on some of these bills and see, uh, I know some of them are going to be scheduled for, for hearing coming up. So uh, we can we can put those out, out in an email blast as soon as they are. Chris, Chris before you move forward, can I, uh, going back oh, to please, helicopters? Go ahead. No, Go no, ahead. just going back to helicopters, I'm just wondering, because you've been actively involved in it at the state level, and I know Congressman Case has been active at the federal level. I'm wondering if maybe we should invite him to have a, a regional town hall, because I'm getting complaints throughout uh, the Windward side of communities, 30 helicopters per day, and I'm getting frustrated myself. And uh, I know that I can contact him directly, but I think it might be productive because he's been working on these issues for a long time. And maybe it might be good for him to uh, provide us with a status and so we can better understand how we all can help, to be honest with you. And um, I'm getting emails every day and I'm pretty sure the two of you are as well. And I feel completely powerless and I just think of all of the issues that we're talking about where I think it would be helpful to have someone who's working on it and let us know what the challenges are because maybe we can cook off, right? Whatever measures are being done, that's all. I just am throwing that out there because, um, you know, I, I, there, I've i been trying to look uh, for a city nexus. I know uh, um, Chair Waters has introduced a measure and we're starting a dialogue, but we don't have a strong ne nexus as much as the federal government, of course. Yeah, I can chime in that as someone who's relatively new to this and does have people complaining in Waimanalo and Kailua about the helicopters all of the time, Barb Meyer here spent an enormous amount of time to get some really great data, which, and somebody actually did that for me as well in the Pohakupu area. And that is so useful because then it, it presents how, how, you know, what a disruption it is in people's lives. Uh -huh. um, but I also feel like my hands are very tied and it's very frustrating. Um, people had told me that it was the FAA and I couldn't believe that the FAA really didn't care and really didn't want to help until I was in a meeting with the FAA, at which point I realized they really didn't care and they really didn't want to help. And so, um, I think it really has to be our congressional delegation um, that controls their funding to make them care about it in the end. Um, I think that is our, you know, there's really not much we can do at the state level. So for example, um, Chris's bill, which I think is a great bill, it will provide data and lay, lay the groundwork. Um, but it, it's in the end, it's because the FAA does not seem to be very responsive. Um, I think it really does have to have to happen in Washington, D.C. Yeah, well, I'm trying I know to it say has to ha happen, but I just want to know what is going on. So that's why I'm recommending maybe we invite a Congressman Case or any other congressional member so they could give an, us an update, right? Yeah, no, I so think I um, Congressman Case is very grateful when um local state level officials 
get engaged in this issue because he does need that support. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And, um, you know, the state did have for a little while the helicopter task force, um, which it just disbanded, which is, um, it's it's a blessing and a curse, a blessing because the task force itself was heavily skewed toward the helicopter companies and not enough community uh, engagement. Um, but on the other hand, now there's not a venue for that. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to work together and, and if folks wanna, um, uh, participate and, and spread the word on that, we can find time and set that up and reach out to the congressman and, and the rest of our federal delegation. Great, great idea. Esther. And, um, uh, Chris, what I might do, I don't have the number. Um, I know, again, Chair Waters has a resolution. And so what I'll do is uh, the other avenue is, uh, so we're going to have an official hearing on it. So maybe I can ask Congressman Case. He always likes to, he's, he and other members have testified on various measures. And so uh, the reason I'm saying this is that then the community can also testify at the same time and hear some of his responses. So, okay, anyway. Yeah. Thanks for organizing this. It's just good to uh, have a little more time to talk story about the different issues impacting the community. Yeah. Okay, what was next? Uh, what are the bill numbers for foreign political buy-in and uh, election abroad fundraising. Uh, those, those bills uh, to prohibit foreign contributions into our political process and not have legislative fundraisers during session, that's Senate Bill 166 and Senate Bill 555. Um, what else we got? Are there any, oops, where'd it go? Are there any land areas that tourist while well, we're on helicopters? Are there any land areas that tourist helicopters are not allowed to fly over? Military bases, perhaps. There's a precedent for eliminating all tourist helicopter flights over land, maybe. Yeah, um, there are there are restrictions over uh, military bases, and um, I don't remember exactly what the distances are and everything else. Um, and it's there's also some flexibility depending on the weather and times of emergency and things like that. Um, the flight paths can change. Um, I know the National Park Service at the federal level has been working with the FAA to try and identify areas over national parks um, where there should be kind of no fly zones or limited fly areas, that kind of thing. But obviously that's not over our community. So a little less relevant. Um, there is a lot of interest in helicopters. Yeah. So I see um, we have um, when saying we, we've sent video evidence. Yes, I, um, I remember getting the video evidence of the low flying helicopters. There's also been planes doing perhaps mapping going back and forth over the Keolu Hills area that I've been getting a lot of complaints about. It's very frustrating that our state actually doesn't control our skies. The skies are federal and um, but if there's any particular one, if you have identifying marks like that and can share it, we do report them and, and, um, and hopefully it does get back to them if they are breaking the rules by flying too low. So please keep sending those in and we will keep reporting them. And um, there's another comment regarding air noise pollution. I think military needs to be respectful of the community. Could military be part of the conversation in future meetings on this matter. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, um, when I was first elected back in the day, uh, there were a lot more flights over the Bellows area, and we worked with the military, and they were actually pretty responsive, and they changed the times that their flights um, were conducted, and they changed the routing and everything. It's actually been the commercial tour companies that have been the least responsive, and just in many cases, completely ignore anything that the community has been saying. So the military has been pretty good on that uh, front. You know, they still have their their incidents and so forth, um, but we we can definitely uh, bring them into the table and, and make sure they're part of that. Um, all right, am I missing other questions? Uh, they're stacking up quite a bit. Uh, so just a quick uh, for folks who just joined us, um, please. Uh, if you have any questions you want to ask, either raise your hand and we can call on you or uh, throw it into the chat and we, we can get to it. Um, there's a ton of issues up right now. Uh, 
but it looks like everyone's focused on helicopters. So yeah, is there anything well, beyond helicopters that we want to dive into? I have something that I wanted to mention um, that is not helicopter related. Um, is there is right now it's out for um, the EA for comments the expansion of CTAR, basically the Agricultural Research Station. It's immediately adjacent to the current Agricultural Research Station towards Hawaii Kai, and it's on what used to be the Meadow Gold Farm. And this is something that's been in the works for a long time. And the land, it's a large area, it's sloping. So instead of doing more of the vegetable farming that they're focused on in the current site, they're gonna do a lot more animal husbandry type research and um, maybe also some forestry um, but it will have the same model of training and research and there is a heio in there so that will be they've organized to have a community cultural group um, be the stewards for that heio and perhaps do educational activities there and stuff like that but that um, after I finish speaking I'll go look for the link and I'll put it in the chat but that is available for everyone to look at the master plan and to make comments. So um, with that, there's one other thing I guess I'll bring up as well. Uh, oh, you know what, actually uh, Sharon just commented, uh, Mahalo Esther for bills 38 and 41. Would like to see enforcement be part of the success of this initiative. Uh, great question. Uh, well, thank you for your comment, but let me uh, let me uh, try to answer that uh, because uh, yesterday during consideration of Bill 41, I thought one of my fellow council members was concerned that my parking restrictions in residential communities was sort of um, a lofty dream and when there's no enforcement and uh, I actually said, yes, while it may be true that enforcement is a, is a problem for me, the first thing is for policymakers to state a policy first, and in this case, to enact the law. Uh, you, don't, you don't pass a measure because you're worried about enforcement. It's two separate processes, and, but the enforcement is uh, well warranted. Uh, with regard, let me tackle the commercial uh, activities first because uh, Kailua and Kalama Beach already banned commercial activities. We're having great challenges. And uh, I know that in Kailua, a lot is actually relating to kite surfing and kayaking. And Senator Lee has been working uh, with the Department of Land and Natural Resources, I know, to move the, um, what do you call it, uh, Chris? The, uh, when you, when the kite porters go out. Yeah, the ingress point. It? Yeah, the, the ingress uh... point. And so uh, I'm actually having ocean safety look at the map and I put it up on them. So um, the reason I'm sharing all of this for everyone um, is to, on the beach front, there's two jurisdictions for law enforcement. Um, of course, in the, in the city parks, it's the HPD. And of course, below the water line, it's both the uh, Doe Care, which is the conservation arm, but uh, the Division of Harbors actually has done a very excellent job on the windward side uh, with also, um, um, uh, you know, um, giving um, citations or violations uh, in the thousands of dollars to people who uh, blatantly uh, violate state law. So uh, as it pertains to uh, Waimanalo uh, and Bill 38 in particular, um, I feel that Bill uh, 38 is attempting to send a strong signal to everybody uh, what the, uh, uh, the community of Waimanalo uh, want in their, uh, in their neighborhoods, right? Now, uh, we need to work in concert with DLNR and because um, they run the wiki permits on the beachfront. And so I am working with uh, Director Thielen uh, and the Blangiari administration uh, because they can do it administratively and take the permits off. And why am I telling you all of this? Because I've spoken to Doe Care and HPD and they've told me, oh my God, it's so frustrating. We don't know, right? So first thing I'm gonna do if the uh, bill gets enacted into law, I am going to have, and I will inform the community. Uh, we're gonna have a talk story with both Doe Care and um, HPD so that they understand what the law is and what their jurisdiction is, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be challenging, but I think if the DLNR aligns 
uh, their policies based on what we're going to do as a city, then it's going to be, be easier for law enforcement in general for both the city and the state. Uh, there is a park ranger a pilot project uh, that Director Thielen uh, recently secured money for. It doesn't go as far as what Chair Waters wants, which is he basically wants a park uh, ranger with complete uh, law enforcement authority to supplement the um, HPD and uh, DLNR officers. And while I appreciate it, I think that uh, I'd like to see uh, Director Thielen's pilot project move forward first. And it's not gonna be a big team, but what they're gonna do is they're gonna make an assessment island-wide of what the parameters are for park rangers, right? And so uh, that's, I guess that's dealing with commercial activities. With regard to um, parking, I think there's two components here. First, with regard to short-term rentals, uh, I found out yesterday it's actually going to be the Department of Permitting and Planning who are going to have to enforce that. And fortunately, they are actually standing up a short-term rental division within the Department of Permitting and Planning to help with overall regulation. And now that I know they're going to be in charge of parking and I'm the one whose amendments triggered it, then I think I need to be responsible and make sure that they have the resources and we hold them accountable in doing their job. I think they're trying to figure out how they're gonna do it. Having said that, at a recent budget hearing uh, with the HPD, uh, with the chief, uh, when he was talking about all of their challenges and then all of their uh, revenue that they generated, it was clear to me that their parking enforcement unit raises a lot of money. And I asked him, well, tell me a little bit more about them. Uh, what is, you know, how can I help you uh, do a better job. He said it's completely different uh, division from HPD because I've gotten complaints in Lanikai that they call HPD and they said they're too busy with other priorities, right? So I guess I want to let everybody know that if in fact that unit is not the appropriate unit, we in the city have to do a better job with regard to uh, parking enforcement period, whether that be over short-term rentals or parking in general. And so that's actually a priority for me. So I hope I answered your questions with regard to uh, Bill 38 and Bill 41. Are there any other questions? People can speak up if you want, we're a small group. Or raise your hand and then I think um, we can unmute you. Okay, we'll go with uh, Luisa and then Melissa after. So Luisa, you should be able to unmute. Mute. There we are. Okay. Aloha. Um, one of my question is, so at our beach park, we have all these signs posted, yeah? And some parts of the beach park, we have signs like no parking on the grass. Um, no passing um, beyond the parking lot, you know, to go on the grass or close to the the, the beach area. So I, re, you know, it's kind of this time it was re, it was in it was enforced, you know, by the police officer or if there's a complaint, yeah, um, made towards them. Other times, it just continues on. You know how the public use it and the signs are just ignored. So I just wanted to ask that question. You know, how can these signs be, you know, um, enforced? Thank you. L Louisa? Uh, are most of the, where, where you're talking about it actually happens in city parks, correct? Or the parking lots? near uh, the city parks, because I can't hear you completely. Oh, there we go. I apologize. <laughs> I was trying to find out how to unmute. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, that's a problem. I have to tell you, uh, I need to talk to our, um, our HPD um, uh, community outreach team because that should they should be helping especially if it's uh, actually a, it's a violation but I think part of their challenge is capacity uh, which is why I uh, feel that 
uh, Chair Waters' proposal for a new park ranger force uh, would be more effective than HPD with regard to our city parks. So it's a good issue. I don't have the, the best thing I could do, Luisa, is to um, follow up with HPD, but I already know that what they're going to tell me, they're going to say, Council Member, we can't be everywhere, okay? Because I call, them, I call them all the time with regard to when uh, constituents, especially at Kailua Beach, saying, you know, there's the lady selling, uh, you know, musa bees or hot dogs, you know, everywhere. And so, and then I call them and they're, what did I, and you know, they go, Esther, what do we say? We said that we got to catch them in the act, right? So we need yeah, to figure yeah. out uh, a better way of how to enforce because otherwise the laws become meaningless, right? Yes. And I don't, I don't under, I don't know the complete answer yet, but I think that because it's been brought to our attention, and then uh, this is my first year, I'm actually passing laws that require greater enforcement, and uh, with that comes Kuliana. So of course it's the HPD and those with enforcement authority, but as the council member who is responsible for certain things, laws then I feel that I need to hold myself accountable to make sure that they're doing their jobs. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mia Lisa, uh, you should be able to unmute now. There we go. Okay, hello, good evening. Um, I had a couple of questions for Bill 38. Thank you, Esther, for all your hard work. And um, I wanted, speaking of signs, that kind of made my second question. In order to get signs at Hunana Niho that say no commercial activity, would it have to be a resolution? Because I know a lot of um, people just say, oh, but there's no signs posted, so we didn't know. I know, I know, I'm dealing with that elsewhere. Uh, no, what we will do, uh, we would work with the Parks and Recreation Department uh, to put up the appropriate signs. Um, I don't know if they have their own in-house, the Department of Facilities Maintenance, uh, is responsible for a lot of the signs elsewhere. So uh, if you could email me that specifically, uh, of course I have to wait till it is uh, um, uh, in law. And I think that would help for when the community maybe goes and tells someone that it's unlawful and then they said, what, Wait, where's the law, right? Uh, I think it might be helpful in prominent cases to have that, especially at the outset. Yeah. So, okay, my other question is, um, speaking of it going into law, does it still go into law if Mayor Blanchiardi doesn't sign it or he That's has correct. to sign off? No, okay. he, uh, that is correct. That's what happened with uh, Bill 34 for the North Shore. Okay, uh, thank it, you. He did not sign it and it, it became law. All right, thank you. Yeah, and so you're, uh, everyone's cool right now. I gave you guys the number. You can also email him again. Uh, I made a call to find out who are they hearing from. And right now it's the opponents of uh, Bill 38. Uh, up next, we have mm -hmm. Kapohu. So Kapohu, uh, you should be able to take yourself off of mute. There we go. Aloha and um, wana mahalo. All of you for having this town hall tonight. Um, Esther, I just wanted you to, um, uh, know that um, our parks subcommittee has been doing uh, a lot of work to try to support however we can, as you mentioned regarding um, Bill 38 and 41. In the meantime, I did some research and I found that in other states, this park ranger program has been quite effective because the community um, similar to ours was asking for it. Mm -hmm. And I also looked at all the various beaches in various states and uh, most of them do not allow weddings, you know, on, on the beaches. And when they do, it's a designated area. And I'm finding a common thread where it's usually on the resort property where um, they work out some kind of, um, co you know, cooperative um, effort um, so that uh, they can get everything in proper order with permits and so forth. Um, also, I found that there is um, a few different training programs that are already been set rather than um, trying to reinvent the wheel per se, that might be helpful to, yes. um, to Laura yes. Thielen on that. Um, also, also found there were 
um, both volunteerism on this, which was, um, it's called a VIP program. And the other thing was, um, of course, they had also trained those to be compensated. I guess there's uh, grants and so forth, federal funding for this. There was also, also a volunteer um, park ranger that uh, they housed on uh, some of the locations. Wow. And what they did is they created some benefits for this particular individual. And I know we do have somebody in Waimanala who has the background that, you know, um, would be a good candidate because at one time at Hunananiho, we did have, um, you know, that available in, in the home that's, you know, there right now being used for other things. So that was just some things that I wanted to, yeah, to uh, include. And later yeah. I've been working with Kapua Madera. So if you need the links and so forth to these um, different sites, I can uh, funnel it through her and keep um, okay. our, the, the chat going on on this. Well, okay. Mahalo. A, couple of, a couple of things. So first of all, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you so, so much for doing um, kind of some comparative analysis. I have to tell you that is uh, sometimes uh, very well received because that means that uh, uh, a um, resident or a constituent or a lawmaker does their research and it really makes it difficult, uh, which occurred yesterday in our zoning hearing when we were talking about fees. But, and uh, if you could, do you have my email? I can get it, I can get it. Ikea Aina, Ikea Aina at uh, honolulu.gov. And, uh, and with regard to the, uh, you know, the individual who's living there, is he a really a park employee? Um, you know, I'm not sure of all the details, but I know. Um, but you're it, just it was, giving me an idea and I know I'm gonna drive yeah. some of my colleagues in the Department of yeah. Parks and Rec. Yeah, I didn't do extensive, uh, um, you know, follow up on that. It's just that I knew he was a, um, a volunteer. No, 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 but give me an idea. Let me tell oh, you okay. my idea, which dovetails okay. with you. So my colleagues and the Department of Rex is probably not gonna like the idea. So we just submitted our first tranche of amendment. Uh, for the budget. And I told you, uh, because I already know a lot of times they um, they don't actually uh, uh, implement congressional ads, I, I was uh, pretty frugal. But I think what I might propose since Chair Waters and um, Director Thielen uh, seem to care about the same issues but have different approaches, maybe part of the pilot project is that we create a specific position at Waimanalo, in Waimanalo, and that mm. could be part of the pilot project. And so maybe I should consider, I would talk to them, they're gonna say, oh my God, but maybe, uh, and uh, maybe we could have that person kind of be part of the pilot because her pilot is just they're gonna do an assessment, right? Maybe right. he can be the pilot, he'll actually be at one of the parks and we give him all of the legal protections to be a, um, a staffer and, and and because we're going to hopefully implement Bill 38, then this will be a bellwether of how to better enforce at other parks. So anyway, just thank you for uh, for actually doing all of that research, but also giving me an idea that I think, uh, you know, the, the worst case scenario is they're going to tell me no. Right. right? You right? know, it's the whole thing about the collaboration and making it easier, you know, on yeah. um, HPD and all the other, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, okay. and that's where, and, and cost effective too, when you look at the liability yeah. issues, yeah. So, so thank you. Mahalo. All right, other questions, if folks have, uh, throw that hand up uh, so we can unmute you or uh, throw the question into the chat for the folks who are just joining. Uh, we've been chatting now for just a quick time check about an, uh, almost an hour and a half. So um, go on maybe another 10 minutes here and we can let everybody get to actually to dinner and to take care of kids and, and off to sleep. Um, you have a question. What are the rules for dogs at beaches and parks? I don't even know the answer to that. Lisa, do you know the answer to that? Um, yes, I, I know um, they are not allowed at the parks. Um, and, you know, to the extent that, um, there's been situations where a dog has been attacked by another dog and when they, you know, tried to, to prosecute, 
they got fined because their dog was not supposed to be in the park in the first place. Um, dogs are allowed on the beaches. So, um, but they're supposed to be on a leash on the beach, which obviously they're not all on a leash, but um, so they are allowed on the beaches, but not in the parks. You know, I will just add into that, um, maybe about, uh, I don't know, three or four months ago, we got outreach from somebody, um, I forget which neighborhood, maybe Haleopuni, uh, but asking about a dog park where they can let their dog run around off leash in Waimanalo. And, you know, we have been uh, having these conversations in Kaneohe and Kailua for some time, and there are some things in the works over there, but for Waimanalo, that's new. So um, I don't think we've had an opportunity as a community to talk about that yet, but there's certainly, um, you know, if there's interest, we can, we can all sort of have a conversation about what might be appropriate, especially if it avoids folks running around um, illegally uh, or endangering kids playing on a playground or what have you. Uh, and then Luisa, uh, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Esther Kiaina for answering my question about uh, City and County Parks and Rec. Um, oh, I think it's just a thank you. It's a mahalo. Um, so other questions, um, otherwise, uh, if there's no other questions, um, do you wanna do a quick wrap up and give um, uh, each of us maybe like a minute or two to sort of summarize? And uh, um, there's a question, time. Charlotte had a question about cyclists. Um, what governs their activities? So cyclists are allowed to ride on the road and cars are supposed to give them, I think, forfeit birth if they are to pass. And so you're not supposed to pass a bike unless you can give them four feet. Um, yeah, bikes, bikes kind of have the right of way legally. Yeah, I'll chime in on that. You know, obviously we have uh, the big highway project that's going on right now through the middle of, of Waimanalo. Um, which has been like easily a couple decades in the making at this point. Um, the earlier portion uh, from Olamana Golf Course to the center of town that was done, uh, put in wider um, shoulders so that folks on bikes had a safer space. It's not totally safe because it's not protected. It's still scary as heck to ride there uh, if, you're, if you're a young kid trying to get to school. But um, it, but it's safer and it takes those bikes out of the, the travel lanes for cars, which makes it safer for everybody. Um, so that's something that the next portion of the highway in, in most places will also have. Um, but one thing that we are working on, because you know, we've been talking with uh, some of the, the families and, and, and the teachers at um, Wyoming Elementary and Media School in particular over the years, there's no safe way to get to school there because at least until now, because the highway has been very tight through that area. And, you know, the, the sidewalks are, are not the greatest at all, if you can even call them that. And there's certainly nowhere to, to safely ride a bike legally. And so um, it's created a dangerous situation. We've had a lot of accidents and crashes and even fatalities in that area. So one thing that we are looking at now is trying to um, get safe ways off of the roads completely. Uh, for our kupuna to walk to church or kids to ride their bikes safely to school. And that's important these days, especially because, you know, the cost of transportation is, is really high now with gas prices and everything else going up. And especially if you have young kids as parents, it takes away from your um, ability to, to go work if you have to take time off to go drop your kids off and everything else if they can't safely get there themselves. So that's something that's definitely a discussion that's, that's ongoing. Oh, Lisa, you're muted. Thanks. Um, so if there's no other questions, let's wrap it up. I really wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing some frustration. <laughs> I'm seeing some frustration from Charlotte with the cyclists who block traffic. And I guess, you know, hopefully with the highway improvements, there will be other options, but legally, they, they have right of way. And even though it is inconvenient to get stuck behind a bike and I myself get frustrated and I think 
they think they're faster than they are. They're not that fast. <laughs> Why don't they go to the side? So I think I have those thoughts myself, but legally they do have right of way. And sometimes cyclists do get killed and that is so tragic. And my convenience is definitely can't be compared to, to somebody's safety. So, um, so hopefully we'll all be patient and make better roads for them. Um, but anyway, so I just want to sign off and let you know that the Capitol is open. Um, as of this coming Monday, there's no requirement to have a test or a vaccine. Masks are optional. So your Capitol is available to you. And um, my office is room 311. I haven't had a lot of visitors. I would welcome visitors. Um, and another kind of fun event that's going to happen is on April 1st, and this is not a joke, but April 1st in the evening from five to seven is art at the Capitol. And I have never experienced it because of COVID. We didn't have it last year, but a lot of offices, including my office will be open and you don't have to have a reason to go in or a meeting. They're just going to be open. All the offices that are participating will be, it will be obvious which ones. And you can just cruise in and check out all of the state art that is on our office walls. When you first get your office, they come to you with a big catalog and you get to pick art to put up on the walls from you know, our state archives. And so it's pretty cool. It's kind of like a little museum and it's a way to come and say hi to me with um, something else to do that's kind of fun. So I encourage everybody to come and visit on April 1st. Lisa, I think there was a question about parking for the uh, event. Um, um, Luisa, I am very sad to say that there will not be parking under the Capitol. There's a parking lot underneath, but I believe there will be parking at the Department of Health, which is immediately across the street um, from the Capitol. And there's also other public parking lots um, like under the, the building that DLNR is in across the street and that's an underground one. So there is parking in the general area, but not at the Capitol itself. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, I'll just chime in also and just say mahalo to everybody for um, your time tonight and for sharing all these questions and comments and, and thoughts with us. Um, I'll just uh, close by saying, you know, we have a few more weeks in the legislative session, as, as Lisa had mentioned. So now is the time to get involved um, because there's no shortage of issues that we face. And um, working together, um, Councilmember Kia Aina and Rep. Martin and myself and um, everybody else in the community at the neighborhood board, I mean, we can we can truly change things, and we have in the past, and it's really exciting. And it only takes a few people to really get engaged and help out. And that's really the only way the world has ever changed and certainly our community. So um, hats off to everybody who's here tonight because you guys have taken uh, more time and put more energy into the community than, than most folks. So I just wanna say mahalo and hopefully the next meeting we have and there will be more, I know that this was seen, um, we can do in person. And that's, that's just an exciting thing after two years of sitting here talking to a screen. So great to see you all and mahalo and thank you. Well, thank you everybody for joining tonight and thank you to both Chris and Lisa for organizing tonight. I saw a question about whether or not there will be more of these. I know we would want more of these. It's very challenging uh, uh, with all of our schedules and, and the, the neighborhood boards. But I think uh, for my part, uh, what I would encourage, and I know that Chair Waters is encouraging uh, all of us to work with his staff. He has a larger staff than ours to have more workshops. And so I'm gonna put a plug out to all of you for anyone who um, wants to learn more about city processes, uh, including uh, what certain departments do. Could you please email me uh, so that um, I can see what we could do to uh, put a workshop together for you better understanding how the city operates. There is a, a website that uh, was just launched uh, within the last two months. It's called HonoluluCityCouncil.org. Again, it's HonoluluCityCouncil.org. And it's a new portal uh, for those who want to better understand how to interface with the city council and the city in general, about how you can engage uh, with the city council, uh, how to report an issue, and then a little bit more about the operations of uh, the city in general. 
I do know that it is the intent of uh, the chair waters to open up uh, the city council for um, for the public to participate in person, I believe in April. Um, I'm not quite certain yet if it's going to be, uh, cause we have where we are, but there's also another room um, uh, downstairs on the uh, second floor. So we're on the third floor for the city council, but there's another. So once that happens, I'll make sure people uh, are aware of it, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be announced on this, uh, on this page. And, uh, uh, I think what is also going to happen is because of the success of so many people who are unable to actually um, uh, get to city council, um, it's going to be a hybrid. So it's going to be in person as well as the continuation of people to do it via Zoom. Uh, but thank you uh, again to everyone who took the time out from this evening to join us tonight. Thanks All a right. lot. Aloha. Everybody.